Dr. McGinty did her uh, medical training in Ireland at National University and then came to the USA to train at the uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, she and Dan Wasichok were bonding this morning over the Pittsburgh Steelers. So, and the third community. And uh, she was chief resident there before she went on to the Massachusetts General Hospital where she did a fellowship in women's imaging. After that, she went to Montefiore uh, Hospital, Albert Einstein in the Bronx, where she was on faculty during which time she uh, did an MBA at Columbia. And after seven years at Montefiore, she decided to go out and do an 11 year private practice fellowship where she uh, became a managing partner in a group out of Long Island in Garden City, uh, New York. She joined the faculty at Lyell Cornell uh, Medicine in 2014, and uh, as a breast imager, she rapidly ascended the ranks and uh, took on many leadership roles at Cornell. Um, she uh, was uh, asked to serve as the chief strategy officer and chief contracting officer for the Cornell Physician Organization that involves more than 1,600 physician members and providers. Her role as lead negotiator for managed care contracts at Cornell incorporated both traditional fee for service as well as managed care contracts, which I'm sure was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, since 2017, she's served uh, as a lecturer and on faculty at the Cornell Combined Cornell uh, Medical and Business School uh, Leadership Program. And most recently, a year ago, she was appointed the Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs, the role that she currently uh, sits in in advance of Cornell. She's an internationally recognized expert in um, imaging economics. She has served as an advisor to the CPT editorial panel, the Joint Commission, and the National Quality Forum. She's also served as the chair of the Commission on Economics of the American College of Radiology as a member of the AMA's Relative Value Update Committee from 2012 through 2016. In May of 2018, she was elected as the chair of the American College of Radiology Board of Chancellors and broke the glass ceiling being the first female to be sitting in that position. Uh, she is a member of the Board of Next Gen Health and has served for seven years as a non-executive director of the National Foreign Direct Investment Agency for her home country department. The published work is focused on health policy and payment models for imaging, most recently on bubble payments for breast cancer. Pushed off, that would have been a big problem if we had that bundled. Uh, her most recent research efforts has focused on artificial intelligence and in relationship to medical imaging, and she's spoken at the Turing Institute and to the World Health Organization focus group on AI in healthcare on this topic. In 2015, she was voted radiology's most effective educator, and I would agree with that, by the readers of Aunt Minnie, and she has more than 17,000 followers on Twitter, something that everyone aspires to be. <laughs> She has given more than 170 national and international invited presentations, including keynote lecture series at UVA, as well as our recent Keats alumni uh, lectureship last year. Known for her untiring willingness to mentor and as a consummate servant leader, Dr. McGinty's presentation today will be the incomplete leader. Dr. McGinty Ross. I feel after that overly long, very kind introduction, I think conference should actually be over. Um, <laughs> thank you, Helen. That was, that was entirely too generous. So um, I'm really thrilled to be here in person, and I'm really sorry I couldn't be here in April. I hope to be a lot less croaky than I was when I addressed you back in April. Um, so I uh, don't have any disclosures relevant to this uh, presentation, but I would like to start by acknowledging um, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be here and visit the lands of the Manahoac and Monacan nations. We should acknowledge that our native communities suffered theft of their lands, remain displaced today. 
our economic foundations for which we continue to banking today were built in part on slavery. And my opportunity in this country and to speak to you today is built in part on these things. So our learning experience, I hope today, will include this recognition. So I'm going to talk to you today about leadership. Having met many of you now, I know that even though many of you are still in training, you are already embarking on your leadership journeys, whether it's as chief residents or the work you're doing in your state chapter. Um, I hope I'll show you a model for leadership that I find you know, a good construct for effective leaders um, and show you some of the incredible leaders in our profession that I think you can learn from who've modeled uh, leadership for me as I've been in my journey. So what, what is it that we need from leaders in radiology? Well, it very much depends on your perspective, doesn't it? If you're at the patient end of that spectrum, what you hope is those who are leading our profession have your interests in mind, are building the kind of radiology care that is going to improve the lives of our patients. If you're all the way at the other end of that and you're an investor, these days you're probably hoping to have to build, build partnerships with radiologists that will allow you to get the maximum return on your investment. So the perspective that you have in our healthcare system is incredibly important. Um, and healthcare, I think, unlike any other industry, has a, a complex web of perspectives and incentives, unfortunately, often misaligned. And as this is something I, I tell my business school students, what is working for one of the people across the spectrum may often be not at all, not working at all well for others. And understanding the perspective of other people, I think, is one of the key things that effective leaders bring to their work. So we're going to spend some time on some of the principles. Am I speaking loudly enough, Alan? No, there's a graphic that's showing up. Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, really? Um, <laughs> um, so we're going to spend some time on some of the concepts in this article. And um, Deborah and Connor and her colleagues are at MIT. And they talk about the fact that, you know, far from leaders needing to know everything, always have the right answer, be the smartest person in the room, those kinds of leaders are actually dangerous for organizations, that they fail to build around themselves the kinds of teams that they need to actually do the work effectively. And the key to this model, I think, is recognizing the incredibly dynamic nature. Why is this not moving? Sorry? Because of the fabric was so big. You'd think, wouldn't you, after two years, we'd all have PhDs and all of these kinds of things. Thank you. So um, the key is the idea that as effective leaders, we need to build teams around us who complement our strengths and offset our weaknesses. And if we believe that we don't have any weaknesses, frankly, we probably shouldn't be in leader leadership. So. The idea is that it's really about a dynamic approach to leadership, that it's not about a one and done. You go and do a course, you learn how to be a leader, and then you execute on that for the rest of your career. If we've learned anything in the last few years, it's that our models of leadership, the way we execute on leadership has to be nimble, right? And we'll go through these, um, these uh, components. And I hope, as I say, I'll share with you some of the leadership journeys of luminaries in our profession who you know, really are, I think, um, examples to be followed. So you know, when we think about the traditional models of leadership, we, you know, we have this, this idea of the visionary leader who's able to you know, bring people together at a difficult time, the Winston Churchills, who is, you know, has, has this incredible vision that you know, builds, an incre builds a company like Steve Jobs. Um, and you know, we have any number of examples of these in our profession. When I think of some of the, the stories that inspire me, go all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, Preston Hickey was a radiologist from Michigan, and uh, he was the first editor of the Yellow Journal. But he had a very keen sense of what it meant to brand our specialty. He was the one who went, the, the emerging name for us was skiographers from the Greek word for shadow. He said, no, we need to tie ourselves to Rentgen's discovery. We need to be called something that, that people will understand what it is that we do. 
And in a, in a move that you can agree or disagree with, he said, we're not going to give, we're not going to print the images on paper so people can take it away. No, we're going to put it on film. So it has to go in a light box and we get to show it. And we get to be identified as the experts who are going to actually, you know, discuss the imaging findings with the referring physician. So a very keen sense of what, what we needed to do to create this idea of radiology as a specialty. These incredible women, Carol Rumack, Linda Farr, and Kay Schaefer, um, met together, I think they met at RSNA, at a time in the early 80s when women were only 8% of the population of radiologists, when we had no women on any of the boards of any of the professional organizations and certainly no women editors-in-chief. And amidst some skepticism, they came together and said, we think that we need to bring women in radiology together for the benefit of the profession to add more of us, but also to think about how to make the profession stronger by reflecting you know, a diversity of views. So I, I'm looking at Bruce's portrait. Bruce Hillman was a dedicated and, and uh, um, uh, you know, always at the AWR meetings. Um, and many years later, I think they have meaningfully impacted the diversity of our profession um, and, and remain a force today. And then Harvey Neiman, who um, many of you will know as the Neiman in the Harvey L. Neiman Health Policy Institute, which does such important work. Um, Harvey was the CEO of the American College of Radiology, but I was fortunate to have known him since I was a resident. Um, his group in Pittsburgh combined academics with entrepreneurialism and an approach to leadership that Harvey then took to influence the entire profession. Felt very fortunate to know him. So, I would say that we have been fortunate in radiology to have many luminaries who have shown us a visionary approach to leadership. But we're also now, aren't we, looking for our leaders to do more. We're looking for the idea of empathetic leaders, leaders that we can relate to and relate with. Leaders like the Dalai Lama, obviously, or, or Jacinta Ardern, the New Zealand Prime Minister, who's here comforting the victims of the mass shooting in New Zealand, who demonstrated, I think, such effective leadership during the pandemic. We have many of those too. Um, the ACR's peer program um, offers sponsored research internships and mentorship to resident to medical students after their first year. As all of you know, um, many programs, many medical school programs don't have a mandatory radiology clerkship. I think they should, but many students don't even discover radiology until too late, right? Um, and Michelle, um, through her network and through her connections across the country, has been able to make that program successful and successfully pivot it um, during the pandemic. And it is because she is somebody who people trust, somebody who people really can relate to, I think, that she's been so successful. Brent Wagner was probably an unlikely choice to be the executive director of the American Board of Radiology. He was a private practice radiologist in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, the balance when it comes to certification between the rigorous maintenance of confidence that we need to do to, to maintain our trust with patients and how kind of stressful and annoying it feels to have to keep maintaining our confidence is something that's been part of American medicine forever. But I will say that when I was in leadership at the ACR, the, the relationship between the board, the certifying board and the community was fractious in many cases. And the, you know, the organizational culture there was something that frankly I found often challenging to, to deal with. Brent came in and his approach to intentional listening, inclusivity of, of a variety of opinions, I think really came to the fore. And many of you may have been part of these discussions when we were trying to understand how much time residents could have away from their program for family or family or other leave and not have to extend their training. And I think that the approach that Brent led there was really about bringing people together, having discussions that were inclusive and that, that people understood that they were being heard. So really, you know, that kind of ability to listen to people and feel, make people feel heard is a key leadership um, strength. So there's four components of this model, and um, we'll spend a little bit of time on. We'll, we'll start with this notion of sense making. And this comes from an article, a pretty scholarly article, um, and I would take this first sentence: turning circumstances into a situation that's comprehended explicitly. What is going on in my organization right now? 
and what do I need to do and what can I do to impact that? That's what sense making means. Not my view of the world, but what is going on in this world. And, and White, the author of this article, talks about cartography as an example. So, you know, this is the world map. This is, helps me understand. This is the world map that most of us are familiar with, right? It was created by a Flemish cartographer in the 15th century. But the map is not the territory because this is the real map if you actually look at the real sizes of the, of the, the, the land masses. And it's a subtle difference, but the map is not the territory. What I see, how I perceive the situation is not necessarily Certainly, probably, I would say almost definitely is not the way that others along that stakeholder um, map will see it. So, as a leader, it is incumbent on you, if you want to be successful, to understand that your perspective may well be very different from others. Get their opinions into the room. Test your conclusions and be open to the fact that other people will perceive and you know, a situation very, very differently from you. And that what you hear, I, I love this quote, it comes from a very obviously, you know, tragic time in our history. I know you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. So understand that, you know, the more you can intentionally listen as a leader, the more you can understand different perspectives. And I think that the college did a super job of this around the Marco legislation. And in, in very brief, and many of you may be familiar with this, the radiologist assistants, we certainly employ them in our practice, who work with many of us technologists who received additional training, are not, there's no way to bill for their services. And, you know, through a coalition that the college um, had with the various societies who represent technologists and radiologist assistants, we believed it was appropriate for radiologists to be able to bill for their services. As legislation does, that was winding its way through Congress. But by the time it became a real possibility, the landscape had really changed. We were, you know, sort of in the middle of the pandemic. Private equity is coming into radiology with decisions based on return on investment rather than perhaps some of the other motives that we would be more familiar with. AI is sitting out there as a perceived threat. And it became very clear that the perspective that we had had was not necessarily the perspective of all of our constituents. And the ACR made a decision to move from supporting that legislation to remaining neutral. And remaining neutral is often a very, you know, very powerful way of saying we're not ready to make a decision on this. And obviously there are people who disagree or, or agree with, with that. But I think the listening that happened there, the intentional way of creating, you know, safe spaces for discussion was something that is emblematic of what effective leaders need to do. So we've thought as a first step, what is happening in my organization? How do I need to impact it? Who else might think differently? How do leaders, how do effective leaders connect with or relate to their organizations? Well, we'll start with the fact that even medicine, which I think is as hierarchical a, a, a profession or a sector as it comes, I do think in many cases is moving away from this sort of command and control. And the old notion of organizational structure, I love this one. This is from the New York and Erie Railroad. Looks like a kind of a bronco pulmonary tree, I think. Um, but, you know, in the days when information flow was extremely restricted, it's possible to think that you would sit in central office in New York and say, we're going to do it this way. And that would percolate out to every part of your organization. These days, many of us in healthcare don't necessarily have one boss. We're in this notion of a matrix organization. Or there are people like me, you know, I have a pretty fancy title. Nobody reports to me. My ability to impact my organization is solely based on my ability to influence it. Nobody has to do what I say. So, um, so if we are indeed moving away from that, how do effective leaders make it clear to their organizations that, you know, what they're saying matters and, 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 and make people feel like they're doing a good job? Let's, we're going to walk through each of these and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time on creating effective teams, because it is something that I think we have a huge opportunity to improve in medicine. So we'll start with staying visible. I have friends in other radiology programs who tell me that they did not see their chair for the whole first year of the pandemic. This guy, my chair, twice a week, we would have a Zoom for the entire department. And you know what? Sometimes it was awkward. Sometimes it was really sad. A lot of times he didn't have the answer to the questions. Um, people ask difficult questions, residents saying, I don't want to get redeployed, they don't have enough PPE, but he showed up twice a week, 
every week. And he was always there in his suit, in his office. Staying visible is critically important as a leader. Right? You have, people have to see you. Being open about communication. Given some of the things that we see from some of the people on the at mini forums or the people who choose not to have their names on Twitter, um, it's a brave woman who is going to say, you know what? Come talk to me. Tell me what you think. Dr. Bello is very much uh, the kind of person who is open to hearing. She's the current board chair, in case anyone doesn't know. Um, but maintaining open communication is so much easier to say that than to do it because nobody wants to hear be criticized. Nobody wants to have difficult questions. But this, this is leadership. Addressing anxiety, but balancing that with making people feel that there's hope. If you have not listened to Dr. Beverly Coleman's presidential speech from this year's ACR meeting, it is an amazing thing to listen to. There's her personal journey coming from the rural Jim Crow South, going to Harvard, and ending up, you know, basically leading prenatal diagnosis at, at one of the world's leading children's hospitals. But there's also the way in which she candidly tells us about, you know, the uncertain future ahead, but makes us feel that as a community, we can come together to succeed and to thrive. So good leaders are able to do that. You know, Winston Churchill, you know, talking about you know, the, the real threat, you know, in Britain in the, during the Second World War, but making people feel like there was enough hope to go on. And then a really important one for radiologists, because we're often accused, aren't we, of sort of being in our dark rooms and not being very sociable, is this notion of creating a network outside of your organization, outside of radiology in, or, or outside of your, your health system. And these are two people who've done that extremely well. Both of them have extremely robust net networks within radiology, but Carolyn Meltzer is former chair at Emory and is now the dean at the University of South Carolina, uh, South Carolina, South, Southern California, and Matt Lundgren has gone from being at Stanford to having a senior role in an extremely large tech company. And they've done that as radiologists because people have understood outside of their immediate professional role, the value that they bring. And it's something that radiologists, I think, if I'm biased, of course, do extremely well because all of you in your day job have to interact with every other specialty in the hospital, right? And navigate, you know, um, those relationships and, and build trust. It's really important for leaders to broaden their network, both to get new perspectives, but also to increase their influence. I'm going to talk now in some detail about teams because I think that, you know, the way we're trained as physicians, go back to our initial training, remains very much about the heroic leader. I'm the one that can fix it. I'm the smartest person in the room. Um, and we know that we need to work effectively in teams. I think that we're doing better areas like interventional radiology. I think, you know, there's, there's, there's great teamwork. But this research from Google may well have hit your radar. Let's be clear, Google is not a perfect employer. They just fired their AI ethics team, which is a little concerning. Um, but they, they spent a lot of money thinking about how to build effective teams. So we'll come back to what, what that research found. But let's think about sort of how we build teams. The first thing I think we start with is who we are. And um, I've talked a lot about this book, um, the, the author's a friend, and um, this book is called um, This is New Power. And what it says is that successful organizations, successful leaders now will understand how to engage people according to, you know, how they like to work. So we've, we've done some work on this at the college and we realized that our younger members weren't really necessarily interested in joining a committee and coming to committee meetings for 10 years and possibly getting to be chair. No, they wanted to come in and have impact. They wanted to do, you know, do work. But we bring ourselves to our teamwork as different people. And so there's a very, un, I, I have a list of the references, which I'll share with you. It's a very unscientific quiz in this article, which kind of you can go through to determine what your personality type is or how do you like to work? Well, I am way up here. So I'm the kind of person that has big ideas and I love to invite everyone to be part of my big idea and part of my activity. And I like nothing better than, you know, just getting together and brainstorming. Do I like to put structure on that? Do I want to have to do minutes? Do I want bylaws? No, I would rather, I, you know, I hate that. But the things that I do have the risk of not being sustainable, not lasting. If I'm not working with people down here in this other um, quadrant. Now, I'm not saying that Bill Harrington is like Kim Jong-un. 
But having someone, and Bill a felt was a fellow board member. Bill was somebody who I could always rely on to know the bylaws that govern what I was trying to do, understand the process of getting it approved, and help me take my, you know, frothy, you know, fun, but not necessarily always sustainable ideas, and make sure that they actually got embedded into policy. So knowing who we are and knowing who complements our strengths and offsets our weaknesses is a critically important part of building effective teams. I really like this article too. And this one sort of drills dr 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 a little deeper into <laughs> who we are. And, you know, these are, again, they said there's no p-value on any of these articles, but I think we can recognize ourselves sort of along that extrovert, introvert, and probably more characteristics in one of these boxes for most of us, right? Um, and this article really talks about the sort of anatomy of teams and how we get the best out of people who are in each of these boxes. Um, and the, the first thing it does is it says that as a leader, the responsibility for the team's performance is yours. If it, the team isn't performing, it's because you're not composing it and leading it effectively. I'm, I'm, I, I absolutely agree with that. But many of us, I think, hobble ourselves right at the start. Because when we put teams together, our, our natural incentive for most of us is to bring a whole load of people together who are like us whose approach to the work, whose interests, whose backgrounds are like us. So we've hampered our performance from the start. So good leaders understand that, step back and say, I need a person who's going to have this perspective. I need a person whose style is this. Um, I don't like this word tokens, but it's in, the, it's in the article. But if you're going to bring people who have a different perspective into a team, it's really important that you make sure that they're, they are empowered to participate. Um, as a leader, you need to make sure that they, their value is that you've highlighted their value because otherwise they'll, they just won't feel like they're actually going to be able to, they're going to be able to participate and contribute. So getting their voice out there earlier, you know, teams and group situations, it's so easy, isn't it? for group think to take hold. One person, especially if it's the most senior person in the room says, well, I think you should do this. Who in the room is gonna feel comfortable saying, you know, I think that's not a great idea. I'd rather we do this. And um, if you don't, as the leader, offer people the, the, the ability to present an opposing or dissenting viewpoint, you are going to, you're going to uh, be asking for a, a poorer performance for your team. Jim Brink, who was my board chair when I was by, when I was in Alan's position as vice chair, was was great at this. The team should not know your opinion until all of them have had a chance to give theirs, right? Because the minute you've said your opinion, it's very very difficult for people to be able to um, to be able to speak up. But I'm not going to ask people to say whether they're introverts or extroverts, but I think you can probably tell that, you know, I'm a, an extrovert. And our leadership culture in this country is extremely biased towards extroverts. The way we teach in business school is extremely suited to people like me. Um, but so maybe that's just what's successful. You know, maybe we should just have a whole pile of extroverts, right? You know, because these quiet people, gosh, you know, why do we have to, you know, why do we have to make an extra effort to have them, you know, participate? Well, yes, been there, done that with this one. Um, these are the people who are going to take someone like me aside and say, you know, that's not going to work because of, or did you notice that in the contract? Because I think that's probably going to come back and bite us. So as a leader, especially someone who's an extrovert, you would be wise to not only bring people like that onto your team, but listen to them. Now, Having them participate, and I'd love if there's anyone in, in the room who, or, uh, who wants to comment on this. You have to be really intentional about making sure that the quieter, more introverted people on your team feel comfortable participating. It may be that you're saying, here's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. I'd love to get your perspective so they can prepare. Um, giving people time to prepare can be key. Also, it's about not putting people on the spot about feedback. Let's be clear, the only emergency thing that we deal with is a code. So pretty much you can always wait for someone to take the idea away, reflect on it, and come back to you with an opinion. And if you do that, you're going to get a broader stakeholder engagement, and you're going to be less likely to slip up, and your ideas and your team's performance are going to be better. Relationship building, that relatability is key here. Understanding what each other brings and valuing that. But also be really aware 
the stress that you place on people who are quieter. I always tell my business school students, I'm going to call, I'm going to cold call. That's what, you know, I, I want to hear your perspective. I don't want to make anyone look foolish. If you didn't do the reading, just say so. But I had one student email me and say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not, I will not speak if you don't call me. We've had to find a way to build trust for me to tell her that I, it, I really do value her perspective. And we've now gotten to a thing where I can say, I'm probably going to want to hear from you on this next topic because I think you have some expertise here and she's feeling more comfortable doing it. But then if you are a leader who is more, you know, focused on the details and wants to get everything, you know, nailed down, wants to make sure we can actually execute on these ideas, someone like me in your group can be incredibly annoying. It takes me about 10 minutes before I'm bored and then I'm probably checking my email and I might not have done the reading, although I'm pretty good at doing the reading. Um, but how do you, how do you harness the often disruptive energy of people who are incredibly extroverted? Well, um, you know, put time limits, but give them the idea that we're going to have an open brainstorming session. You're going to have fun in this session. Things like polls, and I use these a lot when I'm teaching remotely, polls and competitions to keep people engaged. Um, you know, it's, it's tactical, but it's worth doing. But back to the Google research, what they found is that teams that are diverse in perspective are and, and who are intentional about empowering people's start work styles innovate faster. They see problems more quickly and they find better solutions to those problems. And this is work that was done in a business non healthcare entity. But gosh, isn't this something we would want in healthcare? I think it is. Those teams have higher job satisfaction. Important things that they did going back to the external external facing they they built net networks by spending time with different people. We talked about um, you know, you talked about Dave Larson, who, you know, when he's doing dinners for his, his course, having people switch seats in dinners so that they're not sitting next to the same people the whole time. And they tend to give equality in terms of conversational turn taking. They didn't have a couple of people monopolizing the conversation and became very skilled at understanding how people were feeling. And this is the takeaway that I think has made it into the popular vernacular that psychological safety more than anything else was critical to making a team work and you know being able to work in a in, in an environment and with a with a structure that allows us to be successful I think is is what we need to expect from our radiology leaders. I'm going to talk a little bit briefly though about how we build these teams. How do we spot talent? Um, it's something you, I feel you need as a leader to be extremely intentional about. I have, I keep a list, you know, um, and I will tell you, Juliana, you're on my list and it says interested in global health. Um, I know Arun is interested in patient centered care so that when people are asking me, you know, who do you recommend for this committee? I've got a sense of people who, you know, I can recommend knowing their interests and hopefully having had a chance to get to know them. So understanding that they'll be successful. Um, but as a leader, when you are sponsoring people, what I always say about this, and this is where I think we saw the penguins journey at, at, Jer at Jersey, you, when I sponsor you, you go out there with a Jersey with my name on it. And if you don't perform well, for whatever reason, that discounts the value of my recommendation the next time. So how can you develop talent as a leader, um, in a way that's risk, not free, but, but, but that de-risks it. It's short assignments, the kinds of things that we said we wanted to do at the college, bring people in to do a, a project, see how they do in that sort of time constrained and, and project constrained way. And then if they're not successful at this and they're still interested in working with you, find something else. I'm very fortunate. I started my work at the college doing quality and safety, and it's critically important work. It wasn't for me, though. <laughs> and I was fortunate that the college gave me an opportunity to do something else. Cardinal sin as a leader, do not do this. Do not be the person who has somebody amazing working for you and says, you know what? Oh, we could let her move up, but who would do her job? I need her here. Don't do that as a leader. Sponsors, there are some incredible sponsors out there. Um, these two have been really phenomenal for me. Penny Resack, somebody who really only needs one name in radiology, the chair of Memorial Sun Catering, and Jim Brink, the chair of uh, Mass General Rhythm, both of whom are the kind of people who will ring me up and say, I think you should do this, or I'm sponsoring you for this, or I'm putting you on this. And I, I know that they know me and I know that they trust me to take their jersey and wear it. Um, and we are very fortunate when we have people like those in our lives as teams. So we've talked about sense making and relating. 
Let's talk briefly about visioning and inventing. There are, I, I mentioned a few people at the beginning who had vision. A couple of other people I'd like to mention. Alex Margulis is actually the late husband, Hedy Resek's late husband. I was not fortunate enough to know Alex. He had a luminary career. But the thing that he did that impressed me was he created a unique society that brings together academic leaders and industry. He saw that the future of our specialty, especially in radiology, was going to need that synergy. And, you know, we certainly run into each other in various fora, but the idea of creating a way that those leaders could come together, see and hear each other's perspectives, learn from each other, truly, truly struck me as visionary. Dr. Pisano, who I would, I would say is the premier clinical trialist in our, in our profession, who, you know, more than anyone, and I'm a breast imager, so I'm biased, I think has helped us to talk about the value of what we do. You know, the DEMIS trial, which showed the value of digital mammography, the ongoing TEMIS trial, which I'm so proud is recruiting a more diverse patient cohort than is generally typical, looking at the value of tomosynthesis. And I had a great conversation with Carrie about what we will do with the CMIS trial in the future. But if somebody who really understood the need to do something different um, and, and had that vision. And the last one is inventing. Healthcare, I think, has an incredible propensity to frustrate innovation. There are so many things that need to be different in healthcare, and yet our very complex system so often frustrates that and, 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 and nothing changes. Um, when I think of you know, the kinds of concepts that we need to embrace to be effective leaders in really creating a new path forward, this is a story that I find inspiring. So Don Berwick led Medicare during President Obama's first term, primary care physician. This story, very briefly, the escape fire story is, is Montana in the 50s. It's a, um, a brush fire and there's a firefighting team that's dropped in to fight it. It becomes very clear they are failing. There's a number of missteps and the fire is going to overwhelm them. One of them says, what we actually need to do is we need to set a fire around ourselves. Because if we do that, then the fire won't have any more oxygen to consume or what anything else to consume and we will we will be saved and they did that they basically set a fire around themselves in the face of an oncoming fire and the point was look you know we've tried a lot of things in healthcare but nothing we has done have done has given us outcomes that you know really make it worth spending 20 percent of our gdp nothing we have done has stopped us spending 20 percent of our healthcare dollar on diabetes you know having you know what was it 40 million people now who have diabetes in, in or pre-diabetes so, you know, who are the people who have done things in radiology that has truly disrupted where we've been? And this is an example that probably only someone who's been chair of the Economics Commission would actually choose. Um, and uh, this is Jim Warfield. You might know the fellowship that the ACR has that bears his name. And without going into sort of the really wonky economics of this, there was a point at which in the, during the birth of the RVU system, the radiology was looking at a very, very significant cut in our reimbursement, which would frankly have really, really challenged our ability to innovate um, because we are a technology specialty. And what Jim Moorfield and others, he wasn't alone, he was then the chair of the board, did was they said, you know what, rather than fight this RBU system, rather than sort of protest against it and give money to whatever RADPAC was at the time and try and prevent this happening, we're going to get right into the middle of it. We're going to be better than anybody else at this RVU system. And they were. I mean, the, the, the tradition, you know, from Jim Warfield leads straight to Zeke Silva, who's currently the chair of the, the, the committee that determines the RVUs, who is the first radiologist to take that on. But he flew from his private practice in California every week to, to work on this. He testified in front of Congress all the time as Probably the, a lot of the radiology community were saying, this is terrible, just stop it, just make it go away. No, he got in and he influenced and he and he and obviously colleagues really disrupted something for the benefit of our profession and most importantly, for the benefit of the patients we serve. So, you know, we are looking for leaders who will take those bold steps, right? So, um, as we finish up, I, I love this model. I find it very um, a very effective way to talk to my students about effective healthcare leadership, effective way to teach. 
Um, it, it captures the dynamism, dynamism that we need from healthcare leaders. It captures um, a, a way to manage the complexity. But gosh, we've learned a lot about effective leaders, haven't we, in the last couple of years? And I, I really began to wonder, is this enough? Is this, as I'm teaching healthcare leadership, is that model enough? Um, and started looking at some of the leaders that I work with at Well Cornell. And I'm not going to recommend that book. It's not a great book, but I do like the way, the way they talk about some of our leaders. I don't really like it all the way they talk about some of our other leaders. But anyway, um, they talked about people like Tony Hollenberg. And Tony, as of the end of this week, will no longer be our chair of medicine. He's going back to Boston. Um, he doesn't always have that mohawk. That was kind of a fun, crazy thing. But they talked about the way in which our leaders showed up. And as the chair of medicine, who's an academic endocrinologist, Tony probably didn't have much to contribute on the ICU floors in terms of the actual work. It was the fact that at a time when, remember how dangerous that felt, he showed up not once a day, but twice a day, rounding, being there, you know. And so what I started to ask myself, well, what, what do we, what can we draw from these experiences? What can, what can we learn that can potentially inform the development of future leaders? So I did some work, um, with um, a couple of my graduate students, um, and we asked our leadership, what are your, what are your leadership values? Um, what do you think are the values that we share as a community? And what do you think the competencies are that you need to be in a effective one? This is probably gonna come across a little bit small, but you know, we, we heard about, we didn't hear about you know, power, we didn't hear about control, we heard about consensus, emotional intelligence, listening and on the competencies we didn't hear about finance or accounting now i will i will say that those are probably assumed you know you, you kind of think you should have, have have those ones we talked about open environments communication value shared values and fostering team growth so when i'm teaching that leadership course next year i'm probably going to use some of that four capabilities model I, I think there's still a lot of resonance in there for me but i'm going to be talking about how we lead with our values in healthcare. And one of the cases that I do teach already that I think really illustrates this is there is a return on investment when we live and lead with our values. Carla and Harris joined Morgan Stanley as a new graduate from um, Harvard Business School in the mid 80s. So if anyone has seen Working Girl, my favorite movie of all time, the time when there were very few women in investment banking and probably nobody who looked like Carla. Um, she's gone on to a luminary career, well worth reading more about her. Okay. She has very strong faith, wonderful singing career. She sang at Morgan Stanley's memorial after 9-11. But there's a business case for this, that you will differentiate yourself if indeed you live your values at work. Now, that does not mean it's going to be easy. Are, are the leaders, the leaders um, who have taken us through the pandemic, George Floyd's murder, social justice, have been challenged as, as probably never before. And this article, which talks about how leaders should respond to those difficult challenges, was published in 2018. And, and you know, these so these um, graphics on the side look at polarization. I'm guessing if we if we redrew the one for 2022, we probably have very little in the middle, right? It's so such so, such a difficult time. And leaders like Mark Benioff from Salesforce, Kathy Carter, who was um, with the um, Soccer Association saying that you know it, it's imperative that leaders do lead with their values and that they listen to and align with the values of the people in their organization but that's not easy is it that makes for some difficult conversations and we have to put those conversations in the context of trying to do the work every day the diversity of the views that we're you know we're intentionally trying to engage with and those the polarization of some of those views but we certainly have some people in our history that have done that, and I think that we can go back to. Um, this is Dr. Henry Wiggins, retired radiologist in Chicago, who graduated from medical school in 1959, 1965. He's the only black radiologist on staff at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago. And he decides he's gonna to go to Selma to march with Dr. King. I've linked an article that he wrote for his college newspaper, but um, imagine getting on that 17, year, 17 hour train ride not knowing what's at the end of it, but also not knowing what your colleagues thought of you, you going. I was asked what I, could I accomplished, and I replied, I would stand up and be counted. I have 
been told certainly over the last few years that we shouldn't be political. And what I would say is healthcare in this country is political. The same year that um, Dr. Wiggins goes to Selma, Lyndon Johnson signs the Medicare Act into law. So not only does that act provide affordable health care to millions of seniors, but it desegregates American hospitals. Why? Because the government says you're not getting Medicare dollars if you're going to have segregated wards. And they set up an, you know, a, a way of enforcing that. So health care in this country has always been political. We will have to find a way if we are going to live our values and truly represent the values of our patients to have those difficult conversations. So when I was thinking about somebody that I should show you who I do think does that, I did not have far to go. Your chair is somebody who is not afraid of the difficult conversations, but as Carrie said to me in our conversation this morning, is somebody that can bring diverse views together and make the difficult decisions and keep people on board. So even if they wouldn't have made that decision themselves, they can understand why it's important for the organization for that decision to be made. Um, and I could say so many things, I could probably go longer than your introduction of me, but I think that your scholarship that you set up to um, bring, again, students from underrepresented minorities in medicine into interventional radiology, the collaboration that you had with industry there, there are so many ways in which you live this. So um, you've been so fortunate to have Alan as a leader, and I know that um, you know, uh, you're thinking now about the next phase of this. So um, I'll tell you that you know we're all looking forward to your ability to take your leadership and teach the rest of us. So thank you all for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Wow. Great presentation, except for the last one. <laughs> <laughs> so, sit up here unless somebody tells me how to get rid of it. <laughs> um, so questions for Dr. McGinty. She covered a lot of ground, a lot of deep thoughts in there. And I have, um, uh, on the, I actually, on the last slide, I have a, a, a QR code, so we'll put that up. Yeah. And so I, I think um, living and leading through your values are critically important. How how do you manage in your various leadership roles uh, when you come across leadership whose values are diametrically opposed to your values and trying to reach a consensus to getting to a yes or something that is reasonable? I would say that it's, it's extremely rarely that I have been in a situation where I have felt people's values were different, were diametrically opposed to mine, but I would, I, I certainly know that people's belief systems or priorities would be different than mine. Um, just even sort of the day job I had where, you know, I'm negotiating with people who work for publicly traded insurance companies who, who's, who are tasked with, you know, who, who have a fiduciary responsibility to create shareholder value, you know, but the people that I'm negotiating with aren't bad people. They're just incentivized in a different way. So I think understanding people's incentives is always important. The building relationships is always important. And, you know, I think it's one of the, the, the real privileges that I had as an ACR leader was, and I tried to prioritize it, was going around the country and meeting people so that when we were, in, when I was in leadership in the college, I knew people and I, I, I knew that I wasn't talking about a faceless group of people. These were friends. These were people whose views I might not agree with, but I certainly respected. So I think it's listening, it's respect, it's relationship building. But I think when you when you get down to the nitty gritty, right? You can't, you can't dance around this question. You have to decide what you want to do as an organization. And I think, you know, that's where things like strategic planning are so important because that's where you do the work to say, what does our organization stand for? Right? I sit on a public company board and you know it's we have to be very clear on shareholder value, but how are we going to create shareholder value? So that everything we do, because Wall Street's looking at us every single day, has to say, were you, were you doing what you said you were going to do? And it's no different in healthcare. If we say we're going to put our patients first, are we doing that? Does every decision that we make, can we can we tie that to, to what we're doing? All right. So Inspiring talk as always, Geraldine. Thank you for joining us at UVA. We spoke about values at the end and industry and you know all these uh, strategic planning groups. 
there were a series of articles that came out in the Times in the last couple of days about what McKinsey did for a group of hospitals mm -hmm. to basically increase revenue. And McKinsey is classically thought of as, you know, housing some of the most intelligent, most creative minds, mm -hmm. a lot of the leadership kind of qualities to talk about. But despite all the lip service to how do we improve the patient experience, how do we provide greater value in healthcare, that's just not happening. And each of these so-called disruptive forces, CBS entering in, what Jeff Bezos and Amazon are going to do, it doesn't change. It still ends up being a predominantly profit-driven, shareholder value, um, basically, strategy that every healthcare institution from the top down, and I mean, it, it's not an easy question to answer, but what will it take to start to disrupt that current model? Mm -hmm. I think that we have to start with a medical profession and a medical in leadership infrastructure that reflects the community, that better reflects the communities we serve. Um, because when we do that, we bring that diversity of voices in, then I think we make decisions differently. I'm not saying that's a panacea, but I think that's, a mis that, that's something we've left on the table up to now, right? The medical profession and, and the healthcare workforce is generally as diverse, if not more diverse than the population it serves. Leadership doesn't look like that. Um, I, you know, I'm when you have a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I always tend to look at things through a payment policy lens. We get the health care we pay for, and we pay for service, and we pay for procedures. We don't pay for, you know, managing social determinants of health, or at least not at scale. So we have to think differently about how we finance healthcare, and I recognize that's extremely disruptive to radiology. But I think. That the conversations that we are starting to have now about the value of, of what we do, the work that S is doing with TMIST, or um, we're doing a lot of work on this in, with the sort of international radiology community on how do we actually codify the value of what we do? How do we have, have we we have been late? Lazy is a strong word. We really haven't been good enough. And Carrie and I had this conversation about contrast mammography. What should we use when? What's the actual what's what's the added value of another test? Just because we bought a new piece of equipment and we publish a lot of papers saying it's really good at doing this, are we going to stop using the other piece of equipment? No. So we need to be more rigorous about talking about the value of what we do. We did some work for a Lancet commission um, that Hetty led on the value of imaging in cancer, which you would say, well, duh. But in lower middle income countries, when you're making difficult decisions about funding roads or schools or healthcare, what are you going to invest your money in? We had some folks at the Harvard School of Public Health model for us. $170 of productivity gain for every dollar invested in imaging infrastructure. So there's value in what we do. Maybe we're going to have to spend a little bit more time and energy justifying that value, and maybe it'll be difficult. But I'm confident that we will be able to do a Jim Moorefield on whatever payment system comes out and, and be okay. And maybe one more question for Geraldine. Any other questions? I'll ask a tougher one. Okay. Uh, that was pretty tough. But that, but that McKinsey art. Yeah. Hope nobody has friends of McKinsey. So it's, it's building on what Maroon asked. Um, you know, in the last decade, the number of people involved in healthcare uh, have gone up, but relatively speaking, the administrators have gone up significantly mm -hmm. more than the number of physicians. At the same time, administrators' compensations have gone up close to 3,000%, mm -hmm. and physicians' compensations have not gone up nearly, barely double digits when you allow for inflation. Um, How do we reverse the trend of the MHA and the MBAs, um, spilling off some of the money to, towards, because no one comes to see the MBA or MHA to the hospital, they come to see the physician. How, how do we sort of change that discussion? So we spend about 8% of our healthcare dollar on administration nationally. And you could say, well, we have to spend it on administration because the payment system is so complex. but. I would ask you to think about it the other way. I think we accept that that administrative cost because we still think there's an upside for us in the payment system as it is. So we 
I'm saying we very, very large. But I also think that why it's worth you spending an hour listening to me talking about leadership versus, you know, some clinical content is it is really important that we have physicians in leadership. There's some work that people, Tom Lee, Toby Cosgrove, who is the CEO at, at Table Clinic, have done that show that health systems with physicians in leadership, and not again, not that we're the smartest in the room, we have to, you know, we have to work in a factory team, but healthcare, health systems with physicians in leadership outperform those that don't have physicians in leadership. So it's really important that we invest. Not everyone is going to want to run a health system, but we absolutely need physicians at the table to make the strategic planning and investment decisions that are going to get us towards something where we're not spending a ton of money and where we don't keep sort of trying to, trying to wring a little bit more upside out of a frankly broken payment system and actually create a payment system that delivers better value for people we've sworn an oath to serve. That may tie to your topic about leading with values because I think physicians are wired with different value sets than Business people. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't generalize. I've seen some pretty scandalous <laughs> positions. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, we, as I say, have normally sworn in oath, so it's coming on us. <laughs> so, uh, on behalf of the department, I'd like to give you a small gift. Another so, one. You guys have uh, <laughs> So, this is a really small gift, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that you and John enjoy that. They're um, little. Uh, Scotch whiskey glasses with the UVA. You know as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, thank but you. Thank, thank you so you. much for coming to visit us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you.